Well, uh, good evening, Texahoma campus leaders. Yes, if you're in this room right now, yes, you are a leader. Now, as the once famous Joey Gregory said, preaching is a participation sport, so I'm going to need y'all on this one, amen? The title we've been given is With Loud Cries. We're starting in Hebrews chapter 5 and starting in verse 7. It says, during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became the... Now, this isn't the first time you've heard this, this one of worship, and it's not the last time you're going to hear this scripture. My name is Kyoja Ben, and this is my awesome spiritual co-leader, Mia Wilson. And I got to ask you guys something. Have you been submitting to God in your devotional life, or have you been quitting on God in your devotional life? You know, Jesus himself had to learn obedience through his suffering. You know, why do we know this? Because the Bible states it. But we know this because Jesus prayed with tears and, and, and with loud cries, it says. You know, I got to ask you one more question. When was the last time you got on your... Yeah, yes, you do. Yes, you do. Because Jesus himself cried, right? Jesus knew that God was the only one that could save him from death. But he also knew he had to submit to his will and not his own. You know, sometimes we pray, but still try to take matters into our own hands, right? We, we, we think we're putting our trust in God, but it's really in ourselves. We can't forget who's in control. We have to imitate the one we follow. You know, Jesus let his worries and concerns be known, but he still submitted to God's will. And he was heard because of this. We shouldn't go into prayer with the intention uh, of wanting what we want. But we need to ask for what God wants for us. You know, if you want to be heard, then start submitting to God's will. It's what you're reading in your quiet times. It's pretty simple. You know when you're having a conversation with somebody, uh, and you can tell they're not really listening because they're already thinking about the question they're about to ask you? That could be us with God sometimes. You know, in 2024, we need to have a year of reverent submission and fervent cries in our prayer. We get Of God? I mean, you know, sisters. You know, I love what um, KJ shared, and I really love this scripture because it really just shows how we can. Right, but Jesus sets the example for us in this, right? And I know you guys all got planners, and I do too. I love, love, love a planner, right? And something I caught myself in last year is getting too caught up in my planner. I was in the plan, but I wasn't planning with God, amen? And so, sisters, have you been planning with God, or have you been planning on your own, right? And if you've been planning on your own, it's time for you to go wrestle in prayer, like KJ said, and really get submitted to God and his will and what he's calling you to do. And for me, this is something that I really had to wrestle with at the end of 2023. What I did is I wrote down a list of things that was controlling me, and I burned it. And at the end of 2023, I'm no longer going to allow those things to control me this year. And I encourage you to do the same. That is my practical. I love you guys. Amen. Family, I cry my prayers. So this year, don't miss a quiet time a single day this year. And set a day of the week, every day, that, you, that you're going to set that time to have that deep prayer to God where you cry out to him, I love you, and to God be all the glory. Good evening, family. I hope y'all fired up for these sermonettes. Do want to lift up KJ and Mia for sharing that. My name is Sandin Dodi, and to the left of me is my... I only got two minutes to talk, so let's get right into it. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2, verse 1 through 2. Give me an amen when y'all there. 
It says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to reach each other. So my topic right now is talking about discipleship. Mm. Who will be qualified to teach others. Two men I want to lift up in my life who discipled me before. One is Kenny Ube, and the other one is Zeno Bogle. Now, now to be honest, I'm like, why would they give me two people that I do not relate to? What do we have in common? But honestly, I'm so happy to see Zeno. I'm like, man, I get to get rebuked by Zeno again. Oh, my gosh. Those rebukes hit different. Amen. That hits different. You know, but honestly, what I had to realize is that they don't have to relate to me. I have to take the traits that they have that I don't have and apply them to my life. the traits that they have and apply them to yourself. Because what's going to happen is you're going to have all these good traits from each disciple that you have. Some of y'all may switch from one disciple to five disciples within a year. But what you have to understand is that you're going to all this room and put them into yourself. And once you do that, I promise you, you'll have more good qualities than you have bad qualities. But honestly, you really have to study your discipling. You have to pay attention to them. Really pick their brain. You know what I'm saying? And also, discipleship helps you grow as well. Being a discipler. Uh, my own disciple, Lee Funcho. You know, uh, honestly, he pushes me a lot. I'm not going to lie. I get off work, go to campus and share. I may not have these time. He'll text me. I have work in the morning. <laughs> he wants to call me at 12 o'clock at night. Bro, uh, he's just talking about stuff. I'm like, hey, amen, bro. Look, I'll talk to you when I get off work tomorrow, bro. But honestly, this also helped me grow my patience and my We're scared to go through those things. We're scared to pick up the phone at 12 o'clock at night and deny ourselves. But honestly, with that, it's also grown my heart a lot more. It's also grown in my, it helps me grow my patience. You know what I'm saying? Was I like that when I was 18? Yeah. You know? But honestly, he really helped me grow a lot. Zeno's helped me grow a lot. Kenny's helped me grow a lot. And I hope that when y'all have y'all disciples, y'all pay attention to them, and y'all will grow a lot as well. So each of your disciples, and put it within yourself. And with that, I give you Omalara. Wow. I feel so honored to be able to talk to my beautiful, radiant sister. But God has honestly put it in my heart to be, like, open with you guys. Is that okay? Can I get a little real with y'all right now? <sighs> you see, I really value and enjoy this topic, um, just because some of you may or may not know, but um, a while ago, um, and I was just battling with this um, discouragement, hope deferred, loneliness, um, and I honestly did not believe that somebody could really bring me out of this pit that I was in. I didn't believe that somebody could actually help me change into the person that God has called me to be. You know, but praise God. I came back. I'm here. Hallelujah. Yes. Thank God. You know, and I honestly. Satan to play me in this game and take me out. He's not taking me out again. Now I'm here to stay. And so. I really thought about this one scripture, 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 2, in the MSG version. It says, and, after and I know that we're all trying to go to new heights and, you know, reach new goals this year. And I know I am. Um, but I honestly believe that really honing in on discipleship relationships is what's really going to help us level up in these relationships. So, sisters, I have a couple practicals with you, and then I'm off the stage, okay? It's that I honestly believe to really see the beauty of discipleship, one, get open with your discipler. What do you like about discipling? What do you think can grow in your discipling relationship? Two, pick a characteristic in your discipler that you want to imitate and really go after it, walking with them this semester. And lastly, pray to God to really soften your heart in discipling. God answers all prayers when you fervently cry out to him. Amen, guys. So, yo, just to recap on what she said, make sure you guys imitate what's in your disciples, regardless if you have one or five or ten in, within a year. 
just know that there's many good qualities that you can take from that. And with that, that's it. Thank you for letting us talk. Good afternoon, Campus Ministry. Man, I'm talking, and we are talking about evangelism. My name is Kenny Ube, and right next to me is an incredible, amazing, spiritual, beautiful sister in. So much, Brian Carr and Joe Alley for letting us preach today. In Matthew chapter nine. Verses 36 and 37, before we read it, as you turn there, the Bible says that the translation of compassion in the Hebrew is to love or pity and is what we Americans call merciful. You know, this mercy stems from the feeling of feeling someone else's suffering. And you feel it so much that it makes you go through the same exact pain. You know, this word was so often used to describe Jesus' actions, and as he walked on this earth, he wove it into every interaction he had. From the thousands that he fed, to the woman, the lone woman, who was bleeding. And today, I want to share with you this scripture, because this embodies his heart. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 36, it says, Jesus went through all the towns, and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. You thought you had a schedule? This man was on a mission. Compassion on them. Why? Because they were harassed. They were helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. You know, one of our instincts as a human race is to react. And at that moment, Jesus saw the suffering of people, and he decided to act on it. You know, my sister is going to give you guys an illustration of such. First, I want to speak to my sisters today. When I saw that we had this charge, I was very grateful because I love how they're comparing compassion and evangelism, putting us together because many times we really don't think about compassion when we go and evangelize, right? We're always like, okay, all nations and this generation, you know, get everybody, tell them what they need to do. But do we have that compassion? Are we doing this out of duty as a disciple? Or are we doing this out of love for that soul? You know, I always think of um, a time where I realized, man, I don't have the compassion for the loss that I once had. There was a sister and she was just telling me, a baby sister, she was telling me her goal of how many people she wanted to share with. And real quick across my mind, I was like, okay, let's see if she can pick that up. And I was like, whoa, whoa, where did that thought come from? And I thought back to when I was a baby disciple, and I remember doing the, my 40-day packet. I had a goal, and I was like, man, I want to share with 50 people every day. We're going to get it easy, right? And I remember so proud of myself. I was keeping tallies on my planner, and I remember telling one brother, and I was like, yeah, I'm sharing with 50 people every day. He's like, all right, sis, we'll see how long you. Okay, I'll see you. But it got... <laughs> I got to the point where then I realized, oh, this is where the discouragement comes. Oh, am I sharing because of these 50 people I want to hit my goal, or am I sharing because I actually have that love for them? You know, a lot of times when we share, we share because, like, oh, I'm a disciple. This is what I need to do. I need to get Bible studies. Oh, my disciple. Or are we sharing because we have compassion on that lost soul? I realized, why did I want to share with 50 people? Because I remember the women who were in my Bible studies to 1 a.m. counting the cost with me. I remember people like Ruby Vegas. I remember all these women who poured out their hearts and gave me that compassion, that love as they shared their faith with me. So ladies, I want to call y'all. When y'all share your faith, share as that's your sister you're going to see next week at church. Share. Don't share because it's your duty as a disciple. Share because you have that compassion as the Lord shared, showed to you. And thank you for letting me share. Amen. In closing, family, without compassion, there can be no mass action. And without action, And at the end of the day, when everything is gone and the mountains have been turned to flat lands and the seas to dust and there is nothing on this earth left, what are we going to have but each other? And that is what I want to put before you, family. We're not going to do this by ourselves. We're going to do this together because we have compassion on each other.
and we have compassion for the lost. I love you guys. Let's rock this world. Well, hello, everyone. You guys all said it, but my name is Bella. But uh, my, my charge I've been given is every day in the temple courts, and this is about daily Bible studies. If you were at the session last night, you may or may not remember, this is actually what Gavin and I spoke on together, and I talked about three motivations as to why it is so important to have daily Bible studies. One was fear of the Lord, two, love for Jesus, and three, being obedient to his word. And these three things should spur us, should convict our hearts. Bible studies. And so today I want to talk about not just having Bible studies, but having quality Bible studies. Yeah. And so my title that I made for myself is Quality versus Quantity. Yeah. I think it's incredible to have a lot of Bible studies going on. This means that so many women are eager to learn about God. And I believe that when campus opens up in a few weeks, we will have a lot of Bible studies. But shame on us, sisters, if we Turn with me to Luke 13. I'm going to read a long passage, but then I'm going to be quick afterwards. Luke 13, verse 22, it says, Then Jesus went through the towns and villages teaching. Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up, but he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate, we drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. People take their places at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and first who will be last. You know, why, why do I read this scripture? Jesus, he starts teaching about the kingdom of God, and he wants to make it clear that there is a choice to be made. In this passage, Jesus is asking about, or Jesus is asked about the quality. Jesus replies with quality, speaking directly to you. The important thing is, is not how many, but that the time is limited. There will be some on the other side um, seeing what's going on through the gates and not being able to participate in the celebration. All one needs, sisters, to enter through is to study the Bible with you. You, sisters, are the answer for so many. Let's go after daily Bible studies. Thank you. I'm on that Moses, David, Joseph, Jacob. I've been on the road, let's take it. That's where I hold my faith and so forsaken. I know they won't embrace me. Hey, Amen. Well, guys, my name is Zeno Bogle. This is my awesome sister, Cindy. The scripture I will be referencing, not reading for the sake of time, is Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Now, I want to paint a picture for you. Now, listen very carefully. If we lived in a world where police officers only put handcuffs on people, what kind of world would we live in? Police officers raid the trap house, and they put the cuffs on the trap boys, and then the police officers leave. What are the trap boys going to do an hour after that? They're going to break free, and they're going to go sell drugs somewhere else. The police are meant to handcuff them, take them to jail, put them in a cell, then bring them to court, put them before a judge who will then sentence them. If the police do their job halfway, we live in a world of chaos. In the same way as disciples, when we make disciples, we can't do it halfway. Jesus says we gotta make disciples and baptize. The, the, the 
campus culture is creating what I call the uh, great misinterpretation instead of the great commission. The great commission says make disciples and baptize them, but it also says to teach them to obey. Obey everything I have commanded you. Too often we're all hyped up for the Instagram story. We want to go live. And I'm going to be honest with you, God does not care about your Instagram story. Five years after you baptize that person, they're not worried about the Instagram story. They're worried about whether or not the person who baptized them is actually going to fight for them to make it to heaven. You're and you got to teach them to obey everything. That includes finding a hairstyle that's fitting. Come on, Sandin. My brother came up here looking like 19 Savage, amen? It's okay. I told him. I told him. It's, it's okay. Right? We have to be complete in how we fulfill the Great Commission. Now, what that means, right, is in order to, I'm going to give you guys two practicals. You with me? You can't have a vision of baptizing people. That, that can't be your motivation. The vision you have has to be this person standing before their judge on their day of judgment. And then hearing God give them a life sentence. It's you to be fruitful. In order to be fruitful, you have to share your faith in a way that is, one, fearless, radical, unhindered, intentional, and tenacious. You can't share your faith in any less way. you got to share your faith and let this person know you expect them to repent when you study with them, and you're going to drag them to heaven with you. Okay? Another thing you have to understand. If you really want to be fruitful, you have to believe you are revolutionary. I believe I'm a revolutionary. I believe this is a war. It's not a game to me when I go to campus. I'm not trying to impress Brian with my studies. I'm not One day, I'm trying to bring souls to heaven. I want you all to grab this vision and say it with me. Repeat after me. You ready? Repeat after me. This will change your life. I am a revolutionary. I am a revolutionary. Sheridan, raise your voice since I can't hear you. I said I am a revolutionary. Some people still sitting down. Revolutionary. I still can't hear you. I said I am a revolutionary. They can't hear you. I said I am. Yes, it's, it's my turn now. Uh, but hello, sisters. I'm super excited to be here with y'all. I very much uh, be focused on other things other than really begging God for fruit, right? Uh, I have a question for us this afternoon. How much time do we really rather spend scrolling on TikTok or on social media rather than on our knees begging and fasting, right, for God to, to do a miracle and to for us to bear fruit? I think I just have a quick practical uh, for us this, this. Right, let's spend less time trying to figure out our Instagram caption and fast for fruit that lasts. But thank you for letting me share. Let's go! I'm fired up to be here with the Dallas and Texoma Campus Ministries. My name is Connor Corwin from the Oklahoma City Church. And with me on stage. Very spiritual. Girlfriend. Carla Elizabeth. The title of our short charge is He Will Leave the 99. In verse 4, Luke chapter 15 and verse 4. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and he calls his neighbors together and he says, Rejoice with you that in the same way 
there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. This scripture is powerful. We get to see the reaction that God and his angels have in heaven when one sinner repents. And the reaction that the kingdom of God here on earth should have as well. That's drifted away. And someone came and brought us back. In the same way, we have to have that heart. Do find them. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Did the shepherd hesitate? No. He picked the sheep up, threw it on his shoulders, and brought him home. What are you willing to do? Are you willing to pick a brother or a sister up and put him or her on your shoulders and bring them home? A joyful heart. With that, I give you Carla, my girlfriend. <laughs> Good evening, ladies. Honestly, I really love this scripture because this is one of the convictions that I have in my life, that we need to take care of the flock. And today I'll be able to share a couple uh, practicals with you guys that have helped me in my walk with God and that will help you. So let me uh, go for it. Uh, number one, fellowship. During meetings of the body, read the room. It's that simple. Read the room. Yeah. Personally, I like to go after. Oh, a simple conversation can change somebody's demeanor, you yeah. know, and perhaps you don't know, you don't have any common things with them, you know, uh, but you can simply just ask them how their day is going. You know, right. you don't know how much you can impact somebody with just a simple hello, yeah. you know, yeah. number two, hospitality. You know, one of the most enjoyable things for me has been to able to invite sisters to the sisters place, you know, and it's really encouraging to me because we have named it Gethsemane, you know, and it's really encouraging because we also call it uh, Olive Garden, you know, and so a lot of the times, well, it's all sisters, we all want to go to Olive Garden, meaning, you know, this is our place. And so it's super encouraging, you know, because we can do so many fun things. You know, there's things we can watch a movie. You know, we're able to watch a movie together, perhaps even a meal together, you know. And it's really encouraging because, again, you don't know how you can impact somebody, you know. And the third thing is to check on each other. You know, a simple text message can go a long way, you know. You need to be able to know what your sister is struggling with. You know, perhaps they need to know how you're doing in order to get open as well. And it's simple as having a quiet time with them you know it's simple as praying with your sisters you know and after keeping the saved saved and with that i love you guys and to god be all the glory EJ, and this is my awesome sister, Hannah Hines, and today I'm going to be preaching about giving generously. In Luke 21, 1 through 4, it says, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. He also saw a poor widow put in two very small copper coins. Truly, I tell you, he said, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these people gave their gifts out of their wealth, but she, out of her poverty, put in all she had to live on. So we have the rich here who gave, right? And then we also have the poor who gave. The rich they gave out of all they had. But this poor widow, out of the last two copper coins she had, she put it. This woman put in more than the, than the wealthy, right? Here's what we need to look at. Jesus was looking at the hearts and not the amount. Jesus was looking at her heart as a form of worship. She gave her all to him. She, he saw that purity in her heart. And he said, this woman out of all she had, was using what she had to advance the kingdom of God. Do you look at your giving to advance the kingdom of God, or do you look at it as a bill? Your giving is not a bill. It is a sweet aroma to God. Amen? The next thing that takes sacrificial giving like this woman is great faith. For this woman to give her last two copper coins, she understood that God would take care of her. Her last two. I know many of you don't only have two copper coins in your bank account, do you? 
So don't complain about how much you have to give, but give more. Give more to God for what he has done for you. I know we spend a lot of money. We spend on Netflix. We spend on Starbucks. We spend on shoes. We spend on everything, right? How much more to the kingdom of God? Give to the kingdom of God out of your heart, out of the purity of your heart for what God has done for you for the advancement of God. And with heart of sacrifice and worship here and as a young Christian in college I'm gonna be honest with you guys I was not focused on these things when it came to my giving at first when I got baptized I never actually prayed about what I was going to give and I kind of just initially chose a random number only until my disciples sat me down then um, we we crunched the numbers together right and my heart on giving was exposed um, I just like the wealthy people, random amounts out of my own abundance, not actually giving God my heart with my giving. Um, and I had no idea what a true sacrifice for me really looked like. Spending money on food, on clothes, on whatever I wanted and giving God my leftovers. And so sisters, if you're scared of the numbers, it's because you haven't actually crunched them before. Because when I did, it really, it really gave me so much faith and conviction in that. I saw how much money I was spending on Starbucks, how much money I was spending on clothes, how much money was actually going into my savings account when what am I going to do with that? That's just sitting there, you know? I could be giving that to God. My ability to raise my contribution and truly sacrifice for the kingdom, you know, and now I actually keep a budget and I make sure that the money that I spend on things like food and and clothes is less than what I give back to God. And so sisters, I want to ask you, are you just giving just to give or are you actually being sacrificial with your finances? I'll give it back to EJ. Amen, family. The challenge for today is budget out your finances with your discipler. I know that sounds so uncomfortable, someone else coming in to look in my bank account. But let's see how we can give more to God, right? Because this is about form of worship. Amen? And with that being said, to God be all the glory. Amen. Well, uh, awesome. Charge. I hope you guys are still awake. Uh, I have asked bless his custom meetings of the body. Let's go to Luke 4, verse 16. It says, He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the This was what Jesus was meant to do. Everybody knew that. He always went there, it was his custom. Now, is there custom always to show up late to meetings of the body? that we always talk about, but this is not because you're bad at timeliness. It's because there's contempt in your heart. You, you don't know what you're coming here for. If you knew that Jesus was coming here to preach, what time would you get here? Yeah. I, I'm sure you will book the hotel a week in advance already. You know, for one week straight here. Why? Because you understand what you're here for. Is your custom always to right after at, at 12 p.m. on a Sunday you dip out? That was me, right? When I, I would like come to church, I would sit at the very back, and then it was my custom. It was like 11:55 a.m. The final song, the closing song. I'm out of the doors. <laughs> Is your custom that? Is your custom all oh, like people? You having people figuring out, bro? Where's this brother during during service? And people asking each other, where's We have to understand that means of the body is very important. It has to be your custom to show up early. This is something that even in leadership we must grow in. Those who were in the pre huddle, we started late. And that is your custom. You want to start church right at 10 a.m. I will start church at 10 and I didn't care. I did not care if you came at 1030. We start in church at 10. This has to be your custom to show up every single time to every single meeting of the body early. 
Why? Because you understand who you're doing it for. And lastly, a, a really simple challenge. For you to maintain yourself committed to the means of the body, hang out with disciples outside of the means of the body. I, I find out very, very highly that those disciples that, meet, that hang out with disciples outside of the means of the body, they stay very strong faithfully. Uh, why? Because all, you're like deep in the kingdom. If you only show up to three times a week, to you have an expiration date on you. But if you have disciples around you throughout the week, man, oh, man, you're going to grow. And you're going to want to do more things in the means of the body. So let's make sure 2024, I'm going to look for you. And if you show up late, we're going to talk. Let's make sure we honor God, and let's make sure we stay committed to him. Thank you, guys.